right, so any questions from the last time we met? Discuss things of a physio nature. All right, so we're going to finish up our, our stuff here. We were talking about uh, equilibrium and how we maintain balance. Uh, we talked about the semicircular canals and how those were working. Remember the difference between like the perilymph and the endolymph and how those were uh, basically when you're moving your head, that kind of moves that, um, basically moves that, that couple of the ampulla there. And, and based on how the fluid is moving, it's kind of opening up, either opening or closing those channels there, those potassium channels the stereocilia. Remember that? The big kinocilium. And if it went one way, it would kind of close it and went the other direction, it would open it. And that changed how many action potentials were occurring. And that was information that gets transmitted via which cranial nerve? Eight, Eight right? That's our vestibular cochlear nerve that gets transmitted. And that would tell us, again, kind of positional movement uh, of the head and whatnot, right? So same thing's happening here when we're talking about the, the saccule and the utricle. Uh, however, they're uh, describing a different sort of motion, and the the, uh, the actual movement here is a little bit different. You're going to notice that these also contain they call otoliths, and these are basically calcium-containing crystals, essentially, that provide sort of uh, a degree of weight um, that helps uh, when you're moving for momentum to kind of carry this in one direction or another. So basically, if you're looking at these, you'd see here that they, uh, in the satural, uh, saccule and the utricle, they contain the same sort of hair cells here, right? So they still have that kinocilium, and again, going one direction versus another, will either open or close those channels, which is giving, you know, sending information via that cochlear nerve. Um, but basically, what you're seeing is that you have these, these otoconia or these otoliths, and these are heavier than uh, the, kind of the surrounding fluid. So when you're moving in one direction or another, you're gonna find that it's gonna carry those crystals forward or backward, and that's what opens up and closes those um, those uh, hair cells, essentially, right? Make sense? Basically, the, the saccule is gonna be for vertical uh, linear uh, momentum, and then you're gonna find that the utricle is better for horizontal uh, linear momentum. So if I'm like, going up in an elevator, which one would be activated more likely? Probably, yeah, the sac will be activated in those cases, right? So again, not really rotational movement, more linear accelerations, what these are, are detecting here. Again, imagine a person who is uh, moving their head uh, from like straight forward to moving it down. You expect something like, say, like the saccule to start to be activated here, and you see that the crystals would kind of pull this gel down, and that would uh, probably open up those those uh, kinocilia, uh, pull them down and open up those potassium channels. Remember, the endolymph tends to be very high in concentration of potassium. So when those channels open up, potassium flows into the cell, and that's what uh, triggers off the action potential, right? This is in con uh, contrast to other cells that generate action potentials, like neurons, where mainly sodium is the main thing that's flowing in to cause that depolarization. Here's potassium. We'll see when we're talking about the, um, the cochlea as well, that potassium is also going to be working the same way, right? So perilymph and endolymph will be talked about there as well. Okay, so looking at how uh, this information gets uh, transmitted, you're going to find the vestibular nerve um, is going to be going to the vestibular cochlear nerve, so cranial nerve number eight is transmitting this information here, uh, and this will send to the vestibular nuclei of the medulla, and then uh, on into the cerebellum. We'll cover the cerebellum later on towards the end of the class when we get to the neuro section, but this is what allows us to get a lot of information about kind of what's uh, what position the body's in, what kind of movement's happening, and allows us to kind of coordinate our movements. So that way we can you know uh, act on the things we're telling the body to do, whether it's pick up a, you know, walk across the room or pick up something or whatever it happens to be. And again, uh, one thing you'll notice here is that the, the eye movements are going to be uh, uh, kind of coordinated along with the information coming in from the, uh, the vestibular apparatus, right? So it's important. That, and so again, when you have cases where the eye, say, for instance, the body's detecting movement, but the eyes aren't um, catching up, that's when you're going to develop what? Yeah, so you have motion sickness, which uh, is uh, you can develop nystagmus, which can lead into that. Um, uh, vertigo is another uh, thing we'll talk about here in just a second. So again, looking at how information from the eyes, uh, the proprioceptors coming in from like the joints and the tendons are being pulled into here. Vestibular apparatus and the cerebellum are feeding into this vestibular nuclei found within the brain stem. And all of that's sending information down to um, either like the oculomotor center, kind of telling us how we should be moving our eyes um, or which direction it should be heading. And then also into the spinal cord where they, they can um, uh, influence, you know, somatic movement of the muscles and things like that. So again, if you have any kind of disruption of this, especially like with, between the eyes and what the vestibular apparatus is picking up, that's when you can develop that kind of motion sickness, that dizziness that occurs there. So good examples. I love this GIF here, uh, especially with like the rise of like VR headsets and things like that. Um, oftentimes you find that um, if the body is detecting some sort of movement that the eyes are not really perceiving, that's where you run into a ton of dizziness and, and, and vertigo that can happen here. So you can see what the guy's seeing there and someone you know kind of kicks him in the back and then all of a sudden his body's picking up some kind of weird movement that his eyes are not really detecting at all and that completely throws him off so he loses all sense of equilibrium in that case right so again not a fun trick to play on your friends if they have like their oculus rift on or something would not recommend it a uh, very mean thing to do 
but anyway, there's kind of these jerky movements that occur along um, when you're still having, especially with the semicircular canals, when you, you stop moving and that fluid is still has that inertia there, you're still going to have some some changes in, in opening or closing of those those potassium channels. And so that can then affect the eyes and how they're moving. And that jerky movement is called nystagmus. And, and that is going to lead to um, that loss of uh, equilibrium, that vertigo that happens there. Because again, the eyes and the brain are not really matching up with what's um, being inputted. Um, so again, the common complaint, a lot of people go to the ER because of this. They complain of dizziness, uh, sweating, nausea, vomiting are a big thing. We, we see that very frequently. Yes, ma'am. I don't thing? actually know. I uh, Googled uh, a GIF of nystagmus. I know she said GIF, so again, isn't that the ultimate divide? GIF or GIF? <laughs> I don't know. I'm a GIF kind of guy. You're a GIF kind of girl. Who can say? Anyway, I just Googled uh, nystagmus, and that's what it came up with. So I figured that was a good demonstration. Who knows what she was doing beforehand? Who knows what she did after? I'll never really know. Anyway, good question. Okay, so any uh, more questions about the um, uh, you know, equilibrium, the vestibular apparatus? Okay, pretty straightforward. I'm um, going into hearing. We know that the cochlea is going to be the main uh, organs kind of responsible for hearing. So we'll talk about how that's going to be working specifically. Uh, we'll talk about the different portions of the ear and how uh, sounds being transmitted from outside of the body and how that gets picked up. And we turn those kind of the sound waves, uh, that uh, kind of mechanical energy, into uh, an electrical <coughs> impulse that the brain can then pick up. So looking at the outer ear, typically sound waves are going to be funneled uh, uh, through the auricle and the helix and, and into the external auditory canal. Uh, and then that's going to channel up into the tympanic membrane, right? So this is the main thing we're going to be seeing. Most of that sound is going to be interfacing that tympanic membrane. And then we'll see kind of what happens downstream from there. Um, obviously, uh, especially with like ENT, you're going to be running into quite a bit of this. You work in the ER or work in ENT specifically. But, um, you know, lots of things can end up occluding this and, and leading to having kind of impaired ability for sound to transmit. Uh, a lot of times you run into like infections and things like that. So so for, for instance, if you had an infection out here in the outer ear, you call it otitis, anyone know? Externa. Externa, right? So again, that's going to be different than otitis media, as we'll see here in a second. Um, but again, you're going to find a lot of complaints for this. So again, this is kind of one place where some dysfunction can happen here. But again, sounds transmitting, hitting the tympanic membrane, uh, and we'll see what happens next. Um, between the tympanic membrane and the cochlea is where we're going to have our ossicles, right? So you have your three bones there, uh, and it's going to be the malleus, the incus, and the stapes, and that's going to be transmitting that signal from the tympanic membrane, again, in that order, uh, and eventually communicating um, with the... Um, the oval window and then basically how the the stapes is, hit, is vibrating that oval window that's going to be transmitting those sound uh the sound waves into the cochlea right so again that's the the interface there now the question is like you know what would happen if you have like really uh, too loud of sounds that are coming in um well we can actually control how much vibration is actually happening there and one way we can do that is with this uh stapedius muscle and, and you can find this right here you can see how it's uh, connected to the stapes by tensing that by tightening that up you limit how much movement the stapes has on that oval window and you kind of limit how much of that vibration actually makes it to uh, the code list so just one way we can try to um, um, you know manage that make sure we're not having too intense of a sound kind of transmitting through because we don't want to cause any damage here uh, over the long run so you know I always think about like going to like a, like a loud concert or something and then you know during the middle of it like it's very loud at the time but then when you get out and you're like you know in a more quiet area you can't really hear anything the uh, stapedius muscle is still very tensed up and you're still trying to not transmit as much uh, you know, sound waves there. But that's one way we can help to control you know, just uh, how much we're really picking up there. Um, just another picture kind of showing the same thing. You see uh, another good picture of the stapedius muscle, how that is going to be uh, interfacing with the, uh, the stapes there. And here would be the oval window it's communicating with. Um, it's, this is kind of the cochlea. I'll show you some more pictures of that. And then the kind of the end point of the cochlea is going to be this uh, round window, which we're going to see is where basically all the sound waves are going to eventually kind of travel out of. Under voluntary or involuntary control? Like, is it that would be an involuntary control. Yeah. yeah, so I can't like control. I can't like squeeze really hard and then try. Uh, at least if you, if you do have that ability, perhaps that is your superpower. I do not know. <laughs> uh, I do not have conscious control over that, though. But it is kind of a reflex sort of thing. It's yeah. the brain's detecting, hey, there's way too much sound going on here. Um, some years might be tensing up having to listen to me um, all morning long. You know, so it just depends. Maybe more in the front row when I'm like extra loud. But Anyway, so once you have that vibration through the stapes uh, into the oval window, that's going to transmit those sound signals. And what you're going to find here's the cochlea is kind of normally it's kind of a, a kind of a spiral sort of shape as you can kind of see right here. Most of these pictures you're going to see it kind of um, uh, lengthened out so that way you can kind of see how the sound waves are traveling. But essentially what you're going to find is about this vibration occurring here that's going to vibrate the perilymph that's going to be located within uh, the, these different chambers here, right? So just note here, and especially in the um, vestibular canal, mainly it's going to be the perilymph. Uh, when we actually get into the actual um, 
actually inside here are going to be finding the, the endolymph is going to be located there where the, where the hair cells are and when the actual organ of corti is going to be lying. But anyway, so what you find is that uh, the frequency of sound is usually measured in hertz and usually higher frequencies are associated with higher uh, pitches. Normal human range is anywhere between 20 to 20,000 hertz. Um, again, some people may have something outside of that. A lot of people, especially as they get older, they lose the ability to hear kind of higher pitches. So that tends to get, um, uh, you know, decrease over time. Um, there's actually some interesting, I remember uh, reading a story about there, these convenience stores in Japan and basically they didn't want these uh, young kids loitering around and so what they would do is they play, play these um, really high pitches to where older people who are kind of having some, um, well, we'll talk about hearing loss and, and age a little bit later on, but older people couldn't hear the high pitches, but young people when they're around kind of loitering, they would be just have this kind of annoying ring in their ears uh, due to that sound, so that would kind of drive them away essentially. So one way uh, you can maybe get kids off your lawn if you're so inclined, <laughs> play really high pitched sounds. Anyway, um, that intensity or loudness is going to be measured in decibels, and so you're going to find this related basically to the amplitude of the wave, essentially. Um, normal human, the normal optimal range uh, is going to be between 0 to 80 decibels. Uh, much higher than that is where you can start to run into some kind of long-term uh, ear fatigue and some damage that can happen over, over time, so we'd like to not get uh, too much above that. One of the things you're going to note is that uh, depending on the frequency of the, the sound wave, you're going to find that it travels a different distance within uh, the cochlea. So the, the higher the sound frequency, the higher the pitch, you're going to find it travels a shorter distance within the cochlea. Uh, lower frequencies or lower pitch sounds are going to be able to travel farther on and probably reach towards the end there, towards the apex of the cochlea. I'll show you an example of what that looks like in, uh, in another picture here in just a second. That's kind of a general rule of thumb with that. So um, once we're in the cochlea, again, this is the, the actual hearing part of the inner ear, right? So it's made up of kind of three chambers. Yes, sir. Uh, you said the, the lower the frequency, the farther travels, but on this slide it shows the hertz go, which is 20,000 is all the way at the end by the crown window. Let me show you a picture here in just a second. Uh, hopefully we'll make that a little bit more clear. Uh, yeah. Um, Anyway, so, so looking at the, there's kind of three main chambers of the cochlea, and what you're going to find is that the upper chamber uh, is going to be called the scale of vestibuli. That's, again, going to be connected up to that oval window. That's where all the sounds are going to be coming in uh, from the stapes, essentially. Um, there's going to be a lower chamber. It's called the scale of uh, tympani. Again, both of these are containing that, uh, that perilymph, right? Um, uh, this is basically the scale of tympani is going to be um, connected to the o uh, round window, I should say, and that's where basically the, the sound is going to end up at the end. It's going to eventually come out of that round window. Um, again, both of these are filled with that perilymph. Um, the middle of this third chamber here is going to be the scale of media. This is actually that cochlear duct. This is where actually all the actual um, uh, changing of that, that sound wave uh, into uh, an electrical signal is actually happening here. And that's through that organ of corti, as we're going to see here. Uh, you can kind of see the, the hair cells associated with that. You're also going to see uh, the cochlear nerve fiber, which goes into which cranial nerve? Also, eight, yeah, so again, same, same nerve there uh, as for the vestibular apparatus. Uh, but again, that's the main function here. We're trying to transmit these uh, sound waves into electrical impulses that the brain can then pick up and convert into you know, what we determine to be sound. Okay, so uh, looking at the vibration, the actual sound transmission is going to be going to the outer ear, goes to the ear canal, to the tympanic membrane, then to the malleus, the incus, the stapes, and then eventually to the oval window. Once that displacement's occurring there, that vibration against the, the oval window is happening there, that's where you're going to cause the uh, displacement or the vibration of the, the perilymph within the scale of the stibuli. The vibrations then pass through the stibular membrane, you know, into the cochlear duct, and then that's where we're going to run into some endolymph right there, okay? And again, that's where the organ of corti is going to be lying. That's where we're going to have the main actual, um, uh, you know, changes from mechanical to, to more electrical signals happening there. And again, once the vibrations pass through that basilar membrane, uh, it's going to go into the perilymph of the scale of tympani and then out to the round window. So you can kind of see it going through. It'll may, depending on the frequency of the sound, it's going to pass through and then come out uh, back to the round window. And again, depending on the pitch you're looking at, it's going to determine how far the sound's actually going to travel uh, through the cochlea. And then uh, at the duct there, um, again, I mentioned the, the frequency of sound depends on how far it'll go. So low frequency sounds tend to travel further. And I have another picture. I'll show you this uh, more clearly in a second. Um, uh, towards the apex and the higher frequency sounds tend to be kind of located more closer to the base there. So here's a picture uh, kind of showing this. So imagine uh, if you were to kind of unfurl the, the cochlea into a straight line here, you can see the, the stapes connecting to the oval window that can then transmit the sound. And by displacing that, uh, that perilymph, that's what's going to be vibrating here within the um, a scale of media. So we're going to actually see the, the movements occurring that will affect those hair cells that cause action potentials. And then depending on where the sound's residing or where it ends up, it'll then transmit down to the uh, scale of tympani and then come out the round window, essentially, right? Um, so looking at the frequency, you can kind of compare that to the distance from the stapes 
tape as you can see here, um, you know, based on the cycles per second, that usually the higher frequencies are going to have a shorter distance they can travel uh, versus the lower uh, frequencies tend to travel a lot farther. So um, I guess I need to go back and check the other picture to make sure that's. Oh, is it correct? Oh, yes, exactly. Yeah, so go straight through and out. Okay, so is that what you were kind of referring to? Yeah, Maybe. The apex is always the, the apex is, yes, that is true. Okay, cool. We're on the same page there. Yeah, so again, lower frequencies tend to travel far, uh, travel farther towards the apex, right? So here's the organ of Corti right here within the um, uh, the vestibular canal, the cochlear duct. Oh, yes. Hello. So where does the, like, the I guess at that point it just kind of dissipates, right? Because at that point it doesn't really connect to anything else, so it just may uh, vibrate and then that's kind of the end of it essentially. It may just dissipate that energy and that's it. I don't know if there's anything else that really happens to it at that point that's kind of, at least for our purposes, that's all we need to know. But um, who knows, maybe if you talk to an audiologist, they might have uh, a different opinion of that or more, or more knowledge on that. As far as I know, uh, the round window just kind of just maybe dissipate, vibrates, dissipates the energy and that's kind of it. Yes, ma'am. Um, I don't know the specific numbers. I'm sure those ranges are out there where like if you, you know, at this range this is where you start to have a particular type of damage. If you go much above this is where you may have, you know, potential like for rupture or something like that. I'm sure the ranges are out there. I just don't know them off the top of my head. Um, but uh, yeah, I talked to like an audiologist, you know, especially like at the VA, those guys are making bank over there because they have so many of these um, vets that are coming in. They've had to listen to like artillery going off and all kinds of loud sounds. They have a ton and ton of damage done over time. And so they get, you know, a lot of hearing aids placed and things like that. But uh, I we used to live down the street from an audiologist. And uh, if you ever, and the one thing I wanted to ask him, I was like, is it tinnitus or tinnitus? He said tinnitus. So I said, I'm going to listen to you because you're the audiologist. So. Uh, that's the one piece of information I picked up from him. But yeah, those ranges are probably published somewhere, right? Anywho, um, right, so going back to the organ of Corti, this is where the actual um, kind of the real business of the ear is really happening here as far as uh, we're concerned. Again, it's going to be located here within the cochlear duct or that scale of media. And so what you notice here, we're going to have this tectorial membrane. It's located here, and this is what's going to be connected to the hair cells. Uh, within the organ of Corti, right? So again, we have the scale of vestibuli, we have the scale of tympani down here. Again, the sound waves are getting transmitted through here, and eventually it's going to be moving uh, this uh, tectorial membrane. Okay, this is the main thing where the sound is going to be transmitted to. And again, this is still kind of physical energy coming through. These sound waves are still coming through here. And at this point, what you're going to find, and again, this is going to be filled with um, endolymph, right, within these hair cells. You're going to find that by moving this, uh, these hair cells are very similar to what we saw within the vestibular apparatus, right? So you don't have that uh, thing, that big uh, kinocilium, but you still have these stereocilia. And when you pull them one direction or another, what do you think that does? It's going to open up some potassium channels, right? Same thing is going to be happening here where you're going to be opening up these potassium channels. Potassium then rushes into the cells, and that's going to trigger off an action potential, right? So and then that gets transmitted over to the um, uh, these ganglions here, and that is going to eventually go into cranial nerve 8 and then get transmitted back up to the brain. Basically, what we're seeing here. Um, so again, those sensory hair cells, and this is kind of a big deal from the reason why I care about these cells so much uh, from a pharmacy standpoint is that there's some drugs you actually can have. If the levels get too high, these hair cells are very susceptible to, to damage from these drugs. So for instance, if you're ever working like in an ICU and you're dealing with a drug called vancomycin, uh, it's an antibiotic or something like an aminoglycoside, like I mentioned before, those are usually kind of bread and butter sort of antibiotics in, uh, in ICUs. If you have their levels riding too high, that tends to accumulate in those hair cells and can cause damage to them. And so it's one of those things where if you have a patient uh, who's complaining like you know, muffled hearing or hearing changes, like that's a big sign. You need to be checking those levels to make sure they're not too high. Um, but anyway, because uh, again, if you lose that, then you can't transmit those signals. You can't turn it into an electrical impulse and then the brain never picks up those signals essentially, right? So again, uh, when the sound waves enter that scalar media, that tectorial membrane vibrates and that's going to bend those stereocilia, right? So then it's going to open up potassium channels that are facing that endolymph. Uh, once it opens up, then you're going to have endolymph flow in. You're going to have the potassium namely flow in here, and that's going to trigger off an action potential. It's going to depolarize the cell. And then eventually it'll kind of flow back out and then it'll kind of get reestablished with the perilymph. Uh, that's how it's going to establish those uh, potassium levels again. You can see how this vibration can kind of occur here. Um, again, it can happen either side to side or kind of up and down, essentially, um, to cause uh, changes and openings of these hair cells. Okay, and then looking from here, so again, we mentioned from the organ of Corti, this is going to uh, synapse with the vestibular cochlear nerve or cranial nerve number eight. Uh, that will then travel up to the medulla oblongata, where you have some crossover actually happen here. So again, you can imagine, again, the distance here is not too far. Uh, if you imagine... Um, 
where that's going. So again, it's kind of synapsing right here in the medulla. A lot of crossover happens here. It's a little bit more complicated than some of the other things we were looking at. Um, but uh, basically what you're going to find is it eventually travels up to the midbrain. From there, it's going to go to the thalamus, which again, most things do end up uh, synapsing the thalamus. And then from there, it's going to go to the auditory complex, usually in the temporal lobe, right? So again, um, so we're having some crossover occurring here from right to left and left to right, like we no normally would expect with other uh, senses that we've already seen. Now, how can you have a hearing impairment? There's lots of different things that can happen here. Either it's sort of a physical impairment or it can actually have damage done to the cells themselves. Um, a lot of cases you may have things, especially kind of, um, um, you know, more bread and butter sort of ENT complaints. You can have things like, you know, buildup of earwax. Again, if you have buildup of earwax in the, in the external canal, can you transmit sound waves too well? Not really, right? It's going to be blocking those sound waves from getting transmitted to the tympanic membrane. Uh, some cases you may have too much fluid building up in the middle ear. Usually there's like an infection. Uh, you have like a otitis media that will develop there. Uh, again, common thing you're going to see in kids especially because, uh, you know, uh, you have the eustachian tube here, again, which communicates, um, you know, with the airway essentially, but that usually gets impinged in kids and so they can't really have a good flow of fluids down there and so they end up getting bacterial infections that develop. And so we see, especially over at Nemours, uh, we have a ton of kids who are coming in um, for, um, you know, tube placements uh, to allow for that fluid to kind of empty out on its own and that kind of helps to, to eliminate a lot of those otitis media cases that come up. But um, you can have, you know, damage done to the eardrum itself, so you can have a ruptured tympanic membrane. Obviously, if that can't vibrate effectively and that can't transmit um, uh, those, those vibrations to the bone very effectively. Uh, you have otosclerosis, where you actually have overgrowth of the bone. Um, otitis externa, as I mentioned earlier, again, you'd have kind of inflammation, kind of swelling here of the external canal, and then even something called glue ear, which again is kind of a buildup of fluid. So lots of different cases you can be preventing kind of that transmission of uh, the sound waves over to uh, eventually the cochlea, right? Now, you can have a sensory neural uh, deafness, which this is basically going to be an issue with the nerve impulses um, that are not being uh, conducted from the cochlea to the auditory complex. Um, in some cases, this can be alleviated by uh, uh, implanting like a, a cochlear implant, uh, and that helps to kind of take over the role of the cochlea and, and kind of transmit the sound waves, converting again to an electrical signal, right? So it just depends on where the damage is actually done uh, and how you can kind of help to fix that. You know, uh, some of it, as I mentioned, especially from a farm standpoint, you know, maybe loss of hair cells, which again, we'd like to prevent because again, you never want to cause deafness in your patient, uh, usually. Um, but again, it just depends on where the actual damage is being done there. And then there's uh, presbycusis this is basically going to be the kind of age related uh, hearing impairment is where you see a lot of like older folks needing you know, uh, hearing aids and things like that to help kind of amplify the sound because again that transmittal is not working uh, as well as it did before they kind of need that louder sound to help get the same stimulation as they would uh, say for like a younger sort of patient. All right so any questions on hearing? Feel comfortable with that? All right next up uh, we'll talk about the so again, the nose helps us uh, against our main, we're going to have olfaction occurring there, uh, another name for smelling. Uh, but also it can help us to do things like warm air, help to humidify and can filter air as well. Uh, so again, good function there. Um, but the main thing we're talking about today is going to be the olfactory apparatus. And again, the cranial nerve associated with olfaction is going to be? Number one, right? So, uh, and then we're going to see uh, basically the, the olfactory receptor is going to be located in kind of the uh, these upper portion here of the nasal cavity. And this is where we're actually going to have the actual smells coming in, interacting with those receptors, and then causing uh, action potentials to occur. So, we're going to see how that works here in a second. Um, those are going to have these olfactory cilia. This is what's going to be communicating with those um, cells, or the, uh, the, the particles coming in that are going to be the smells we're detecting. Uh, it's going to be interacting. We're going to see G proteins are going to be really important. Uh, now, again, when we're looking at taste in a few seconds, um, you know, how many different tastes can we detect? Like four or five, right? So you have like sweet, sour, salty, bitter, umami, right? We have like five, right? However, for smell, how many different smells can we detect? Huge number of them. There's a ton of different smells that we can detect. You're going to find that these uh, are working in tandem, right? So again, uh, if you ever, you ever like, try to eat like good food with like a stuffy nose, it just doesn't taste right, right? Because again, you don't have that olfaction going on. You don't have that smell that's happening there. It, your sense of smell tends to be much more sensitive uh, and can detect multiple different types of smells versus like your taste buds. You can only taste really kind of five different things as we'll see, right? Does the dietitian agree? Does that, that work? Okay, <laughs> perfect. Um, as long as I have your approval, I'm good to go. No. <laughs> Um, so anyway, so we're going to find that, and as I mentioned earlier, we we're talking about G proteins. I don't know if it was in, in this class or form, but we mentioned there's a ton of different uh, genes that are out there that code for different uh, G proteins that, that respond to different types of smells, right? So we can tell the difference between, say, something like, you know, um, uh, sulfur. Anyone know what sulfur smells like? 
And rotten eggs, like you can pretty well pick up a rotten egg pretty easily, or you can detect that sulfur smell. And again, you're gonna have varying levels of, of detection, right? Some things you're not gonna be able to smell until they're very high concentration. Some other things, especially things that are dangerous to us in a lot of cases, tend to be very sensitive. Uh, we tend to be very sensitive to. So, for instance, like if you smell rotten eggs, should you eat that egg? Typically not, right? That's a good thing for us because we don't want to eat something, and get sick, and then die, right? And that's kind of a nice, um, you know, evolutionary kind of advantage we have there. And so again, that's usually where we're detecting kind of like dangerous things for us. You can you can smell those pretty well usually. Okay, so again, the olfactory receptors are going to be these kind of bipolar neurons you're going to notice here. Uh, here's the cell bodies, and they're going to be able to synapse up with the um, uh, cranial nerve number one. But this, the cilia here, where actually the, the actual uh, receptors are lying, that the smells are going to be interacting with. Um, you know, we have uh, roughly 380 genes coding for uh, you know, 380 different olfactory receptors, and depending on how uh, those are being interacted with, we can have a much wider um, uh, number of smells that we can detect versus, again, as I mentioned, taste there. And typically, one odorant molecule is going to stimulate typically one protein. So it's pretty specific for what we're actually trying to pick up here. And so basically what you find is that these are all going to be G-protein coupled receptors. So again, don't forget all your all your G-proteins and different types of receptors uh, that are out there. Because again, they come up again, time and time again. Um, and again, these are going to be requiring ATP. And usually you're going to find these are cyclic AMP um, <laughs> uh, sort of secondary messenger systems happening here. So for instance, if you have a smell that comes along, an odorant molecule is going to interact with these receptors here. That'll activate your G-proteins. That then activates, and remember the enzyme that kicks off um, that conversion from ATP to cyclic AMP? Adenylate cyclate, yeah. So adenylate cyclase is the enzyme that does that. And so you trigger that off, and then that can do things like open up sodium channels or open up calcium channels. And then that's going to then synapse with the cranial nerve. It'll release some neurotransmitter that will then uh, send off an action potential, right? That can then drive to the olfactory uh, center in the brain, and that will say, hey, we have the smell here, right? Um, and you can find that we can have graded responses to this, where you have you know, a very small number of particles, uh, maybe only able to activate a few G proteins, whereas if you have a ton of them uh, present, you know, they can activate a lot more G proteins. And based on that you can have a very wide range of response so um you know some things we can smell only you know a few parts per billion some other things you know uh and you can you know go from a very sensitive smell very small amount to you know uh, very large kind of overwhelming sorts of smells um and again all this is based on how many g proteins are going to be interacting with and, and how big of a response are going to get based on that right so obviously more more uh the smell around more g proteins can interact with the more the actual the, the smell you're actually going to detect there And then from here, you're going to find that the um, olfactory neurons are they're unmyelinated, which we know travels slower, but again, it's so close and, and distance to the, the brain, it's not really going to be a big issue here. Um, but you're going to go from the olfactory bulb. So if you imagine here's the uh, the nasal epithelium, here's where the, all of our, our cells are going to be located here, it's, uh, our olfaction cells. Uh, it's going to transmit up here to cranial nerve number one, and then usually uh, mostly transmit up to the thalamus, right? So we our olfactory center, uh, and that's going to be, uh, again, where we can then send out signals elsewhere to say, okay, well, how does the smell coordinate? What are we doing with the smell? Uh, is there any responses we should have to this, et cetera? It's going to go uh, from the thalamus uh, to wherever it's going to go. And again, um, as far as like chemoreceptors go, because again, these are examples of chemoreceptors, there's going to be obviously interoreceptors, which are going to be more kind of located within the body that detect chemical changes. So think about things like um, osmolarity, think about things like pH um, detection. Um, but these are mainly what we're talking about today are these exteroreceptors where they're detecting uh, chemical changes from the outside. And so again, we're talking about, um, you know, taste buds. They're going to be responding to things that are dissolved basically in our food and drink. Uh, obviously, our smell receptors are going to be detecting those molecules in the air. Uh, and then um, normally you have to have olfactory olf action along with gestation, right, gestation being sense of the taste, uh, those working in tandem, because again, we're going to see they kind of transmit the same areas of the brain, um, those working together provides a lot kind of fuller picture of kind of what we're eating, gives you a lot better taste of things. Uh, as I mentioned, try eating something when you have a really stuffy nose, you're not going to get a whole lot of good taste off of that. Okay, then moving on to the mouth, sense of taste we're going to be talking about, which is located where? On the tongue, right? Yes. I hope so. <laughs> anyway, uh, as I mentioned, taste called uh, gustation. Again, all the receptors are going to be located on these uh, taste buds. So imagine here is the, the lingual epithelium. Here's our taste bud here, and you have these little pores. These are going to have these cilia that the, the actual taste molecules are going to be interacting with here. Um, you can see again there's uh, not as many uh, variety uh, we're going to see some of these are g protein related some of these are just going to be related back to um, different ions as we'll see in just a second here depending if we're talking about salty or uh, sour things like that um, but again um, we're going to find the the taste buds kind of where they're located how they're uh, innervated a little bit differently so those will be some of the things we're going to look at here in just a second 
So you can imagine these taste pores. Here's another example of a taste pore. You have these uh, taste hairs that are going to be interacting with the chemicals, and that will then transmit the signal. Uh, uh, and do anyone know which cranial nerve? Nine. Nine and? That's your two main ones we're going to see here. Nine and seven are going to be involved here. And it's going to depend on which taste buds we're dealing with. Okay, so that's one of the things that we're going to note here uh, in just a second. So looking at this, we're going to find that, again, a taste bud is located on the tongue. And based on uh, where you're at in the tongue, you have different types of uh, papillae, uh, papillae here. And so you're going to find that the main one we're going to be dealing with is going to be the fungiform. This is basically like kind of the anterior, kind of two-thirds of the tongue, essentially. We're going to have these fungiform uh, taste buds here. And again, this is going to be transmitting signals via the facial nerve. So this is going to be cranial nerve number seven is how it's going to be transmitting that. Okay, so again, kind of the anterior two-thirds of the tongue, mainly going to be that fungiform uh, sort of papillae. Okay, uh, if you're doing the circum valley, or this is mainly going to be the posterior surface. You can kind of see these back here. That's going to be along the glossopharyngeal nerve or cranial nerve number nine. Okay, the third one you're going to see are going to be more on the sides of the tongue. This is going to be the foliate or the filiform. And that's going to also be along uh, cranial nerve number nine as well. Okay, and again, depending on kind of where you're at in the tongue, you're going to find that they have a, a different propensity uh, uh, or different um, uh, kind of concentration of various taste buds. So you might have, uh, again, you might find like sweet taste is a little bit uh, stronger towards the front of the tongue. You may find bitters a little bit better at the back of the tongue. Again, they're a little bit more interspersed than probably that. It's probably not an all or none sort of phenomenon. Uh, you guys ever do those like really kind of uh, basic like test like an A&P lab back in undergrad. They're like, okay, put some sugar on your tongue. Where can you taste it at? And that's kind of where they, they, that comes from. But essentially, um, you're going to find they're a little bit more interspersed than, than those, uh, those labs would kind of have you to believe. <laughs> Okay, so then again, I mentioned those taste pathways. So again, from the uh, facial and then the glossopharyngeal nerve is gonna travel up to the medulla and then from there to the thalamus. You're gonna find that um, from the th uh, thalamus is gonna go to the primary gustatory uh, cortex of the insula. It'll then also travel to the somatosensory cortex. So again, we have uh, sensors we can tell where the tongue is kind of located, you know, from a, a um, you know, from a sensation, from a touch sort of standpoint, that also gets transmitted up to the somatosensory cortex. And again, usually taste and smell are going to be located within the kind of the same areas of the brain, so that way we can incorporate both of those together uh, to get a kind of better picture of what's hitting our, our tongue, essentially. So looking at the different taste bud receptors, these are, are good things to know. Um, for salty, you're going to notice what type of uh, ion do you think will be flowing into the cell? Sodium, absolutely. But other things can trigger this as well, like potassium. Uh, if you ever see like a salt replacement, usually that's going to be like a potassium-based uh, salt. You may see that. Again, that'll still trigger um, some of the similar uh, salt taste buds, but usually sodium ions will flow into here. And the general uh, thing you're going to find is that once you have uh, sodium flow in, we know that increases the electric potential of the cell. That will trigger an action potential. And in this case, this will actually um, do things like open up calcium channels, which will then trigger um, uh, some exocytosis of neurotransmitters onto uh, whichever nerve it happens to be, either seven or nine. And so, uh, again, remember calcium is a very uh, potent intracellular mediator, uh, so intracellular you know, kind of messenger here. And this is how we're triggering off those, that exocytosis of all those neurotransmitters, uh, whether it happens to be usually like glutamate and things like that. Uh, for sour, you're going to notice here, what ion is that? Hydrogen. hydrogen. So things are more acidic. are going to be triggering off those kind of more sour sort of tastes there. So you open up the hydrogen ions that flows in. And similarly, this will also open up calcium channels. Right? <laughs> you have that depolarization actually happen there. Uh, so these two are very similar. It's just a matter of what's going to be triggering off those individual taste buds. Where it gets a little bit more complicated is when we're getting into um, the bitter and then the, the sweet and umami uh, sort of taste uh, buds. So the sweet and umami, and again, what, what, what is, uh, has an umami sort of taste to it? Like steak. Burgers, always things like soy sauce, like MSG, I just kind of have an umami sort of taste uh, to it. Um, right, so uh, it's kind of our, our fifth uh, sort of taste uh, that we have there. But basically, these are going to be mediated through the same sort of pathways here, where uh, basically you're going to have either like a sugar or an amino acid or something that's going to bind to a particular receptor. And usually what that's going to do is activate a G protein, right? So this is different. Rather than just having ions flow in and cause an action potential, this is activating G proteins here, right? In this case, you may do something like close off potassium channels, which normally in these cells, potassium is a higher concentration on the inside of the cell. So by blocking the outflow, what does that do to the electric potential of the cell? Have more potassium on the inside, it's going to be more positive, right? Because again, potassium is positive. So by closing those off, by preventing outflow, potassium levels rise, the electric potential rises, and that then can trigger off an action potential to occur. Same thing, uh, then eventually you can have neurotransmitters uh, being released, and then now you have uh, the nerve now being stimulated. For bitter, um, anyone ever tasted quinine before? Anyone ever can find that? Uh, hmm? uh, quinine? 
Quinine is a, the, it's actually a drug we used to use uh, for malaria back in the day. Uh, sometimes you actually find quinine in, uh, I, the one thing I always think about is uh, gin and tonics. So it's usually like tonic water um, has a amount of, some amount of quinine and it has a kind of, um, uh, kind of a bitter sort of taste to it. Uh, basically, these are going to be activating G proteins as well. And then usually activating some sort of secondary messenger system. In this case, you're going to be opening up uh, calcium channels. And then that will then again trigger uh, neurotransmitter outflow and then cause uh, uh, the, the nerve then to be, be stimulated at that point. Right. Um, anyone ever seen like a gin and tonic under black light? Again, I know you guys don't drink anyone here. I'm assuming most of you are actually able to drink legally, but if you ever see it actually glows under a, a black light, a lot of that goes back to that, that tonic water and that quinine and actually glows under a, a black light. So if you ever see that, that's what, what's going on there. Again, you guys probably think I'm all an alcoholic. That's okay. Um, the term functional is really the important thing to remember. <laughs> So again, uh, this table again goes back to showing you how the different taste buds are, are working there. Again, we went through it in, in the picture, so you can refer back to that. <laughs> Okay, so then the salivary glands are also going to be innervated by cranial nerves number seven and nine. Again, we have three main uh, sort of uh, uh, salivary glands. Sublingual and submandibular are going to be uh, innervated by cranial nerve number seven, or facial nerve, and then the parotid gland will be innervated by nine, a glossopharyngeal nerve. And again, because all these uh, signals are being transmitted along similar nerves, that makes sense where you know you taste something really, uh, really good, and all of a sudden you're you're starting to salivate even more because again these signals are being stimulated uh, all through the same sort of nerves there, right? And we'll get into the GI tract. We'll talk about how uh, salivary uh, secretion stimulate and all that a little bit later on uh, when we get to more detail in the GI tract. Mm -hmm. And then swallowing, uh, this is kind of a real brief thing here where, uh, again, this is a very coordinated sort of movement to, to trigger off swallowing. And a lot of cranial nerves are going to be um, involved here. So again, everywhere from the trigeminal nerve, facial, glossopharyngeal, accessory, hypoglossal. It's a very uh, coordinated sort of effort when you're triggering off um, uh, the swallow reflex. And again, some of that is going to be voluntary to actually cause the actual swallowing, and then some of it will be involuntary to the kind of the downstream effects there. But again, very important that this is coordinated. Otherwise, you're going to have food going in, in the wrong directions and wrong areas, uh, especially in the trachea, not where you want it to go. You can see here, you can see how taste and smell are going to kind of be transmitted to similar areas um, within the thalamus, and that's going to be able to incorporate both of those together and allow us to get a, get a better picture of kind of what we're tasting, uh, what we're smelling at the same time, get a better picture of what's going on. Right. Okay, so any questions on sensation? Have your senses all been adequately stimulated? I hope. Hopefully no bad smells. Some tactile sensation. Any, any questions on any of this stuff? Okay, so let's do a 10-minute break. We'll come back and we'll do our Kahoot review for the test.